All right, everybody, welcome to breakout room C. I'm here to introduce uh, Gunjan and Jen uh, with Palo Alto Networks, and they're here to talk to you about Moneyball in the Cloud, which I've been looking forward to this one. I don't know about you all, but uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to you guys, and I'm going to just ask you to stand a little bit closer together so that, uh, exactly, so that folks that are watching online uh, and the recording can see your beautiful faces. All right, take it away, guys. All right. Thank you. Hey, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Gunjan Patel. Uh, I'm a senior cloud uh, senior manager in the cloud architecture team, and I manage the uh, cloud FinOps team, uh, the engineering side. Uh, I've been working in the cloud and virtualization space for about 11 years, and I'm presenting with Chen. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Chen Chao. I'm representing the finance side of the FinOps scheme. As you can see from my title, I have a product operation. So this is a feature, not a bug. Because you have already heard from many other people that the cloud finance is more than just a finance job. You need to really coordinate with different persona and people from different organizations. OK, a little bit about Palo Alto Networks, if you are less familiar with the company. Uh, we are a leading cybersecurity company uh, that offer integrated platforms with best of breed services to protect your digital way of life. And we secure your network, whether it's corporate branch or your employees working from home. We secure our cloud from code to deployment to run. And we also revolutionize your secure operation center using ML and AI. So over the past few years, we have been you know, transforming ourselves into a cloud first company in order to scale our business to grow. And many of the business actually is delivered via the public cloud nowadays. Uh, as our business scales, so does our cloud spend. And this is why I think we are, we'll be talking for the next uh, 20, 25 minutes. Uh, there are a lot of things we can we all like share, but uh, in this uh, talk, we all focus on four dimensions. Uh, you see at the bottom, there's a foundational horizontal slim, uh, the data foundation. After that, we'll share three uh, pillars, the visibility or cost allocation, and then the unique economics. And last but not least, we'll share some thoughts on engineer optimization. With that, I will pass it to Gunjun to talk about number A. All right, so the first foundation is uh, data foundation, which is uh, our data lake. We spend a lot of time building this foundation. Uh, if you're starting your FinOps practice, there might be a temptation to start building tools and uh, operationalizing it. Um, but I really encourage you to spend some time building your data foundation. What we do in our data lake, uh, we collect uh, a whole bunch of different data from uh, the cloud service providers. So the major ones we use uh, GCP, AWS, and Azure. Uh, building data, asset inventory, uh, unit economics data, cost optimization. We have automated labeling, uh, which runs every night and figures out which uh, group of assets belong to which teams, which cost center, all that stuff. Anomaly data, ownership data, uh, security data. So we build a very robust platform on our data lake, getting all that data uh, and enriching that data with our revenue telemetry uh, data from uh, our uh, business side. And on top of that, once we have a robust uh, data, uh, then we build a lot of FinOps services. For example, uh, cost optimization dashboard and services, uh, which is uh, which some of which I'll show you in the later half of the presentation. Cost visibility, which is what Zen will cover. Procurement, uh, unit economics, uh, again, something Zen will cover. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of other use cases that are used by other teams like uh, InfoSec team, vulnerability management team. Um, so a lot of teams, a lot of companies have data. We have also built uh, generative AI-based data exploration uh, tool internally uh, because you might have a lot of data, but it's hard to explore the data. Data exploration problem is uh, a key problem. So to solve that, we have built a natural language interface on top of this data lake. Um, we can talk about it later. I'll hand it over to Jen. Now, okay, we have a beautiful lake, right? And then the first question is, how 
shall we paint a picture, right, using the right data from the big lake to show to the right stakeholder. The way we think about that is this is kind of our framework of you can call it allocation or charge back, share, uh, show back, whatever. It's break down into four components. We start with the usage cost, which is the cloud spend list price, uh, including uh, our EDP or enterprise discount program. And on the right hand side, you can see that this spend actually is owned by the engineering team. They are accountable for the cost control on that. And below the line, right, we have three pillars. One is the procurement discount, and this is like saving plan or cut in GCP. And we also have a allocation, central allocation. There's costs in, uh, created and carried by the central team. Uh, that'll be shared across the board. There are professional services fee from the CSPs. And the green one is the credits. Right? We do receive some credits, like a, there's a migration credit or some one-time incentives from the CSPs. So all those three kind of categories is to some extent owned by the central FinOps team. And net-net uh, will be total cost at the bottom, which is the kind of like true cost or PNL cost. And uh, the way you know we cut in these four dimensions so that we can have distinct ownership for each to drive actions. So put that into practice. What we are trying to address, you know, uh, on the left hand side, you'll see a dashboard. But what we are actually really trying to address is on the bottom right, a few use cases, right? Number one is exact reporting. Our CFO or CPO will ask who's spending on what, how they're spending. That's the first use case. I think many uh, uh, practitioners are also being asked by their executives. And then uh, the finance team would, do, would need to do the business partnership with the product team, with the engineering team, understanding you know, the budget, the plan, the forecast, reconciliations, right? We need to be able to speak on the same language, talk about the same number versus different sources. And then we also want to partner with the business owners, like the product managers, the operators, to help them to make more business decisions and this actually dashboard or vis uh, visibility tool will also help them to accelerate the business decision makings. So based on that, you know, we have a bunch of different features uh, on this screenshot. As you can see, you can break down the cost by different dimensions. You can just add different filters, uh, and then you will get the view that actually will serve your need. And then moving on, right? So once you nail down the visibility, the next question is how can you really move up to the value chain, right? which is unit economics in this case. Uh, one thing just to remind you is, in terms of the unit economics for FinOps, it's nothing new. Right? This problem has been there for other business situations where people have been working on unit economics. So we always start from you know, what is the, the basis for you know, solving the unit economics problem on the first place, which is generic, now just limit to FinOps, which is, you know, what is your unit matrix? Is it measurable? Right. Is it aligned with business priority? And also try to stay focused. Instead of having 10 metrics, 10 PIs, can you just have one or two? Once you have that, what is your target? Do you have a North Star that is really aspirational to the team to deliver? And do you have a plan to deliver? And do you have the clear ownership? And accountability. So, put into that practice, um, you know, on our business side, for the production side, uh, because we are a SaaS company, cloud actually spend is a great portion of a COX. So, we do measure kind of like a cloud cost to revenue. On the R&D side, uh, we also spend at a scale. We measure in terms of spend per day. I think which is quite consistent with some other speakers share early in the morning. And that is overall, right? And then we have uh, some more product-specific uh, metrics. So this is the places where I think uh, lesson learned is you really want to be mingled into the product business conversation itself. So don't think about FinOps as a standalone problem, but think about that FinOps is the piece of the puzzle in order to solve the overall business problem. Right? So how we can help the, the general managers of the business to better understand the unique economics of your product from cloud spend perspective or from other you know, uh, dimensions, adding different data sources. Can you really help your uh, deal review team to think about the pricing strategy? Or when they're you know, reviewing deals, 
how can you enable them to make a better decision in terms of shall we approve this deal or no, we should think about a different strategy. Um, with that, I will actually uh, pass back to Vinjin to talk about uh, our last piece. All right, thank you. So uh, how many of you are from engineering side here? And how many? So that's finance, I'm assuming. How many of you both? Seeing more and more of uh, those. Uh, OK. So in the next section, I'll cover engineering optimization and tooling, whatever, what we have built. Uh, this is uh, the subset of it. Um, so broadly, we have two categories of spin-off engineering services. Um, this is the stuff we have built in the past eight mo months. <coughs> Uh, from dashboards, uh, we have, uh, so through broad categories, dashboards and services. Uh, in dashboards, we have CSP Insights dashboards, so we use all three major cloud providers, GCP, AWS, Azure. Uh, what are the low-hanging fruits there? Uh, what's, what are the recommendations provided by the uh, cloud service provider? Um, we are pretty big on GKE, Kubernetes. Uh, so we have three dashboards there, config-based, billing-based, and utilization dashboard. Um, then we have compute, uh, compute dashboard, which provides compute insights, more details, uh, which is for GCP and AWS, uh, BigQuery dashboard. Uh, and in the other section, services base, we have anomaly alerting, that's for GCP, AWS. Where we see the uh, start, uh, that's something that we had to kill or shut down. Uh, we'll tell you the story about that some other time. Um, idle VM Slack, idle disk, idle project. So we send those out as Slack messages uh, to individual engineers. Uh, budget alert, uh, VM, daily VM shutdown, and overall to monitor how these services are doing. We have built monitoring feedback system. So what you see that in highlighted, that's uh, the deep dive I'll follow. Okay, so the first one is CSP Insights. Uh, this one is GCP. Each of these dashboards have a bunch of uh, graphs, uh, data we present. Um, I'll show you a subset of those. So this one is good for engineering leaders to see we have about 20 product teams. Um, so for each engineering product team, they need to see what is their fat, how much is the inefficiency into their product. Over time, we track it. These are the recommendations provided by the cloud service provider. So um, these are not actual numbers, but uh, the graph is uh, similar. You can see what is uh, this particular team in non-production has uh, a lot of unused IP addresses, followed by change in machine type recommendation, idle VMs. And as you can see, since we started engaging with them on a monthly, bi-weekly basis, you can see that going down. Uh, and it, they're running pretty lean now. So this helps them prioritize and figure out what are the low-hanging fruits. In the same dashboard, there's another deep dive view where you can see uh, engineering managers can triage and figure out for this project, this account, who are the owners? and how many resources have this recommendation, and what is the potential saving. They can click on it, they can drill down, and they'll see actual recommendations there. Next one is uh, GKE optimization. Uh, this is based on configuration. Configuration is sort of a low-hanging fruit, where you can see if your cluster is configured properly. So for example, uh, Google has GKE in autopilot and standard mode. We want to have more adoption of autopilot if it financially makes sense for you. Uh, regional versus zonal cluster. Uh, regional clusters cost almost double, right? By default, if someone creates it uh, in non-production, they might not need it because there is also network cost associated with uh, workloads in regional clusters that are talking to each other across region. Um, the third big one we look at is optimized versus uh, balanced utilization. So uh, Google introduced optimized utilization uh, load balancing uh, three, four months ago. Uh, 
uh, some time ago, we started tracking that. We in, we talked to product team saying, hey, look, you want to use this one to lower your cost. Uh, over time now, it's at 97 uh, plus percentage of our clusters. We also provide detailed cost insight. So uh, each product team, they might want to see how is each of their namespace doing? How is the product team doing overall cost-wise in GKE? How much is each cluster costing? How much is each of the namespace costing them? Uh, so that way, if they're putting some effort, they need to know how to prioritize which namespace, which applications to focus on, and to, and to see uh, how is their optimization translating into dollars. So that's what this dashboard provides. Uh, this is an important one. This one took us a while to build. Uh, takes a lot of effort into this, but uh, this dashboard, uh, our company moved on to GKE uh, in a significant way. Uh, so not everything is 100% optimized in terms of utilization. And this one we are tracking uh, for each pod, each um, cluster, node, project, product team, what is the utilization, what is pod level or provision, uh, and what is cluster level or provisioning in terms of CPU and RAM. Uh, in the same dashboard, we have this hourly breakdown. You can see this um, for this particular uh, cluster or team, how many CPUs do they have? You can see uh, weekday spikes there uh, in green. The utilization goes up there, comes back down, but you can see on the weekends, it's not scaling down properly. So this can surface problems like that. Uh, memory, you can see the utilization is pretty flat, uh, but the orange part is the over-provision part uh, on the pod level, uh, and the red one is cluster idle. So this one, in this dashboard, each product team can dive deep into their cluster, their workload namespace, and see what this graph looks like for all of them. Uh, and that will help them with right-sizing recommendations. Now moving on to compute insights. Um, this is something that we started on earlier, uh, but product teams don't really need to know which regions they are starting their compute instances in. Uh, but in the back end, they cost their, we group them up into low cost, mid cost, and high cost regions. Uh, and we show two graphs. The top one is how many VMs are being created every day. So this is kind of a leading indicator of where the cost is going. Uh, and the bottom one is billing based. How much is the, how much is the actual bill? Uh, and how much of the money they are paying uh, is coming from low cost, mid cost, and high cost regions. Uh, so uh, leading and lag, lagging indicators uh, kind of help us see where the teams are going. <clears throat> Another important metric we track is hourly utilization. Uh, our, sorry, hourly, how many number of average CPUs does each team have in uh, pr production, staging, and uh, non-production? So the green bar you see, it's every hour, how many CPUs do they have running average across the month? So you can see this is pretty common for a US-based team, uh, but this team also has a smaller team in India. So we can see what is their peak hours, what is their off-peak hours. So based on that, you can put those in and see the bottom graph shows how many VMs are being shut down every day. So um, if the, this team is not really working at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., their VM should be shut down. Here you can see May 6th and May 13th, uh, a large number of shutdowns. Those happen to be Fridays or Saturdays. So Friday evening, they do shut down. So you'll see a huge number of uh, num that number dip. Another similar view we have is average across day of the week. Uh, the top left uh, graph you see is how many VMs are being created on what day of the week. Um, besides the obvious problem that some people are working on the weekends, you can see how many VMs are being created. Uh, we, another graph that's not shown here shows how many of them are through automation, how many of them are through humans. 
um, average uh, creation, this is the cost view. So you can see, even though there are uh, VMs being created on the weekend, they're not that expensive. Uh, majority of the cost comes from the weekdays. <coughs> Uh, the, the lower left shows uh, average running VM. And then we have a view to show how much of your cost is coming from the weekend, uh, VMs running on the weekend in, in orange. Uh, some of the services we have, this one is anomaly alerting service. Uh, this is for AWS. Uh, as an example, in Slack, uh, our data foundation has each account, what does that account map to? for owners, who does it belong to? And we internally have a Slack service that can send out notifications to engineers. Uh, and you can send uh, spend-based uh, or percentage-based thresholds. So in this example, for a given account, what is the product, which environment, um, DynamoDB service, the anomaly we found is uh, $1,300 and 9% anomaly. They'll get a notification. They can click on the link, and it will take them to the AWS console to show exactly that anomaly. Next one is um, idle VM alerting. Uh, so if someone has a VM running that's been idle for more than 14 days, we calculate the cost. Uh, one of the things we realize is if you just say this is an idle VM, engineers might not take action. But if you say this is how much it costs, you could save this much money. So the button itself says you will save $12 uh, per year if you click this button. So that makes, that drives some action. <clears throat> um, another thing we are experimenting with in the back end is personalizing these for each engineer, each product team uh, using generative AI. Again, we have all these insights in our data lake. How can we correlate all of them bring it into one message and give it a prioritized action list uh, for the engineers to uh, drive action. Uh, and the final one is, how do we measure how our services are doing? So all these services we have built that send out Slack messages, we track how many messages do we send out. We have assigned matrix to each message, how much time is each message saving uh, everyone, we track every single uh, click, every single button that people press, and we track that. So the orange line you see is how many messages we have sent out, how many, the uh, yellow line you see at the bottom is how many people are clicking on different things <clears throat> for, uh, based on those recommendations. So this helps us measure what is our click rate in the recommendations we send. So some final thoughts and takeaway message. Lowering the bar to action with automated saving workflows with owners in the loop, that really helps. Lowering the bar to action as in, in Slack, it's just a click of a button. You don't have to go open a console or run some commands. Um, that really helps drive action. Having agreed upon KPIs to measure your progress, so what's on that graph is something that uh, we discussed with our leaders saying, this is the measure we are going to use. Uh, is this acceptable to you? And that's how we measure success of each team, how much they are, how they are doing in cloud cost saving. Uh, for each product team, engineering team, shared responsibility framework on what we as a central FinOps team provide versus what is the engineering team, product team's duty. Uh, what they're going to execute, that's a, a, a key thing to be a successful uh, FinOps practice. So we talk about foundation and maybe two more things to add. Uh, the second one to the bottom is to get executive sponsorship. I think the critical thing is you want to have a candid conversation with your executives, asking them, like, what is the priority of FinOps in your list? Right? Is it like number two, number five, or number eight? So depending on the answer, then you may want to have a different cadence, right? If this is number two priority for your CFO, maybe you want to have a weekly check-in. Number five, something like bi-weekly or monthly. Number eight and number 10, maybe a quarterly check-in would also be helpful. So based on the priority or align the priority with your executives, 
and then set up the right expectation and let them to help you to drive a uh, change throughout the organization. And the last one, but not least, is we did not have time to talk about um, to, to maximize your procurement statement. Actually, we did a lot of good work there uh, because this, the, uh, I mean, the organization does not allow three speakers <laughs> on the stage. So actually, we have a, a, my colleague, Abhinav, who is standing there. Uh, he actually is our guy to manage all the procurement, and that could potentially be our talk for next year. And if you want to learn something more about procurement, also you can talk to him. Um, with that, I think we have some blog if you want to take a look as well. Um, and thank you so much for your time. Thanks, guys. We'll open it up. We have a few minutes for Q&A. Um, I really appreciate uh, the insights you provided. Uh, I don't know about you all, but every executive I've ever met, everything is P1. So you must have nice executives. <laughs> <laughs> all right, does anyone have any questions? Just raise your hand. Apologies to all the executives in the room. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. On the graph where you had the number of messages and then the click-throughs, that spread was widening over time. Have you had a chance to look into and drive any insights as to why they're not clicking as much? Um, so we have uh, on the same dashboard, we have a bunch more uh, tabs that show uh, which projects uh, from FinOps side and which product teams, what is the click rate? Uh, and that's that's a concern, but that's something that when we we do monthly service level review with each product team, we tell them this is your click rate and it's declining. Uh, so the leaders usually send a message to their engineers saying, hey, you need to cooperate with this. Uh, but that's something we are looking into. But that was widening because we enabled a third project that is sending out a bunch of messages and people don't know what that is about. Any other questions? Yeah, down in the far end of the room. Excuse me. Hey, thank you. Uh, question for a security organization. How did you get the actionable button press to do an operation in your production environment through security? <laughs> Uh, so the button pressing that stuff, uh, what I didn't mention there is only non-production. Uh, we don't do that in production. <laughs> if you get a board about ThingOps in the next two days, welcome to talk about DevSec ThingOps together. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, over here in the middle. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, from an automation perspective, um, what does what does that look like from a Palo Alto perspective? Next six months, 12 months, 18 months. Sorry, automation? Yeah, from a FinOps automation perspective, what do, curious if you have any thoughts there. Yeah, so uh, many of the, so one thing we learned early on, first thing we automated was shutting down VMs. Uh, but what we realized quickly is Engineers don't really like us, a central team coming, shutting down their VM. Uh, each product team had their own automation to shut down VMs uh, daily or on the weekend, uh, with exception handling, all that stuff. Uh, so that was a lesson learned from us. We need to keep uh, sort of engineers, product teams in the loop for whatever automation we do. Uh, we try to do some automation um, uh, that is central, like some, some stuff in the procurement side. Uh, but We need to, uh, one thing we learned is keeping the engineers in the loop for automation. So click a button and then go through, not us doing it. And uh, w one more question. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I missed the first slide. Can you say a word about who developed everything? Are you guys more on the engineering side? SREs and the developers are helping. Who built the monitoring of the CPU load in uh, Kubernetes clusters, et cetera? It's like so everything we have presented here is built by our team, uh, central FinOps uh, engineering team. Uh, product SRE teams, they might have their own dashboards and tools, uh, but this is something we thought would be useful across the team. Uh, so that's, that's what we have built. 
Awesome. Thanks uh, very much. Round of applause uh, to the guys. Thanks very much. And everybody, thanks for joining this breakout. Thanks for watching that session. I'm sitting here in San Diego right after FinOpsX. We hope you join us next year here live 2024. In the meantime, please subscribe to the channel and join the community. Get involved. Join the summits. Get in a working group. And don't forget to get FinOps certified. It's next year here in San Diego for FinOpsX. It's going to be twice as big. Come join the party. Come meet your people. Welcome home.